This morning in the Atlanta airport, no one's missing a meal on Mac Wilburn's watch. With 11 restaurants to serve passengers, he's got dining for every destination. And it all started when Mac talked with First Horizon Bank about opening a franchise in the airport. Now it's open for business and cleared for takeoff. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. PMS, pregnancy, menopause. Each stage of womanhood has its unique challenges. That's why Highlands Natural's new women's multivitamins are formulated with essential daily nutrients, plus targeted support for your life stage. Facing PMS, there's a Highlands Multi for that. Navigating pregnancy and morning sickness, that too. In the throes of menopause, our formula is here to support you through hot flashes and skin changes. Gone are the days of juggling multiple supplements or guessing what you might need. With Highlands Naturals, it's one multivitamin with daily essential nutrients and science-backed ingredients to support you. An all-in-one wellness solution to lighten the load for women? Highlands Naturals is here for it. Find your multi at Amazon or Highlands.com. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D-S dot com. Highlands Naturals. We're here for it. Hello, thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. It is great to have your company. We've got a lot to talk about today, as always. A bit of sad news to start with, with the passing of Dr. Frank Drake. We'll also be focused on the DART mission. This is a really exciting mission and it's not far away, only a few weeks. And the first image of a, an exoplanet taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. We'll be talking about that and answering audience questions about the observable cosmic microwave background radiation and planets orbiting stars orbiting black holes. Can it happen and what would it be like? Stretchy, I imagine. <laughs> That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining us as he does week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, not quite a decade yet, is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Yes, it'll be decades soon, won't it? It will. <laughs> if we um, if we last that long, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, so do I. Yeah, yeah this is it's going to be seven years by the time we get to the end of this year. It's phenomenal. <sighs> and, and, well, I've said it before, but I didn't think it would last. No. We've, yeah, we, we've lasted longer than the average marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that's a very good point. We have. See, that's my wedding ring. Yes. And that's my space nuts ring. <laughs> uh, there you go. So you're tied to space nuts. They're, they're not, oh, have, have we got a prenuptial agreement? I, I nuts? don't know. <laughs> you know, this is probably one of the only business arrangements that's still done on a handshake. Uh, yeah, not even that. <laughs> not even that. <laughs> no. Not even that. No. no How have you no, been, no, no. Fred? Yes, I've been well, thank you. All That's good. Good happening yeah. here. So, but it's all exciting. Well, I've had a fun week. Yeah, that's uh, what I hear. It I spent good. some time in hospital, <laughs> routine stuff. My son's in hospital. My dad's going to hospital, and my computer died, and my email inbox wiped itself, and I lost everything in separate incidents. So. Can't retrieve anything, and that's where a lot of the Space Nuts questions were. So early appeal for questions because I've lost a lot. Shouldn't keep them in my inbox. But that said, my inbox shouldn't wipe itself, you know? No, it shouldn't. You no. probably need, um, you probably need uh, grievance counselling for I, that loss. Cause I feel like I do. I'd feel like that too if I lost yeah. mine. <laughs> but, you know what's stupid? I can't remember what was in it. <laughs> ah, well, there you go. <laughs> I shouldn't have to. Because it should be there. Indeed. Dear indeed. Anyway, it's been a harrowing week, but I've got a, a new computer down by my ankle, which is doing a sterling job and will probably last me a couple of months. So that'd be good. <laughs> uh, now, Fred, let's talk about uh, these stories, incidents and accidents, and very sad story to start off with, the passing of astrophysicist Dr. Frank Drake at the age of 92. Yeah, it's a good innings. But we've sort of got used to Frank just being there. Yeah. Um, he, um, he, as you said, 90, 
92 years old. He, he was born 28th of May 1930 and um, sadly died on the 2nd of September this year, uh, peacefully and from natural causes. <clears throat> he, of course, is famous for his work with SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And we have talked many times about the Drake equation itself, yeah. the equation he postulated in 1961. If I remember rightly, it was a small conference or workshop of people who were interested in the possibility of <clears throat> of some sort of communication with extraterrestrial civilizations, perhaps even detecting radio signals or something like that. Mm. Um, that workshop included... Well, Carl Sagan was one of the people there. And I think they came up with a, a sort of false name for themselves because they, they were all scientists. But the idea of, you know, talking about extraterrestrial life was so unfashionable uh, in 1961 that they felt they would have been drummed, out of, drummed yes. out of the profession. So they, they called themselves something else. I can't remember what it was. But never mind. It was, uh, the, it, I, I know, Seti and Forgetti. <laughs> <laughs> You've probably had that one saved up, haven't you? It's a good I've just one. thought of it now. <laughs> it's very, very good. We, yes, you should be on the radio, Andrew. I, I'll really. try that one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, they, I mean, the whole idea of the Drake equation was sort of get people thinking in this group of scientists, get them thinking about what, what the issues are in terms of trying to understand whether what, you know, what possibility there is of us picking up signals from extraterrestrial civilizations mm. because he he actually basically made observations to try and detect them quite well known ones with large radio telescopes because he was an astrophysicist but the drake equation <clears throat> itself it, it's probably just worth briefly going through it andrew because yes you know so entrenched in our thinking on astrobiology <clears throat> excuse me the morning frog in the throat there yeah, uh, yeah. so entrenched in our thinking that we we don't really pay that much attention to its details. We just know about it. Mm. So the equation is several parameters multiplied together. And excuse my my ropey throat there. It's quite often the case during the morning. So um, I'll <clears throat> do my best to speak properly rather than be coughing Ra into the microphone all the time. Rather. So you start off. Yep. Uh, the thing you're trying to work out is the number of detectable civilizations in our galaxy. That's the, the thing that these seven parameters all essentially multiplied together will give you an estimate of. And so it starts off with the rates the rate of star formation, which is something even back in 1961, astronomers knew reasonably well. Mm. Um, roughly 30 stars per year within our galaxy are being born. And so then you multiply it by a series of fractions, the fraction of stars that have planets. Now, they had no idea what that was in 1961. And I think, you know, there was a bit of a wild guess that it might be one in 10. But we now know, and it's the one thing that we do know with much more certainty than we did back then, that most planets have stars. In fact, it's possible that all planets, sorry, most stars have planets. We it's, knew what you meant. Yes, we, <laughs> it's possible that all stars have planets. Um, you, you know so, why you got that wrong? Because uh, you had a throat in your frog. <laughs> and I'll forget and Seti as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you multiply the rate of star formation by the fraction of stars that have planets, which we now know is probably one, effectively, then the number of hab habitable planets in each planetary system. So mm. you might think about star planets in the Goldilocks zone. We know that it's, there's a good chance that there might be living organisms outside the Goldilocks zone. You've only to think of the possibility of the oceans of Europa the oceans of Enceladus, which are way, way outside the sun's Goldilocks zone. Yeah. So you might think that that number could be quite high because if you've got a solar system with several planets in it and we've got 18 hours, so we think ours might be fairly typical, then you're going to find at least one probably that's that's in uh, within the habitable zone. So the number of habitable planets per planetary system you can probably put it something near one but then you've got the big unknowns the fraction of planets on which life occurs and that's a total you know we can only guess at that yeah uh, my guess is that microbial life will kick off wherever the conditions are right for it to do so yeah uh, temperatures pressures um, uh, the, the right kind of molecular background lots of organic chemicals 
enough lipids that you can form cell membranes, all of those things that feed into that. Mm. And so it may well be that that fraction is reasonably high. If you've got a habitable planet that you might, you know, that it, that it might actually host life. But then the next one is the really tricky one, the fraction of those life or the fraction of life planets that that kick off intelligence. Yeah. And, you know, the, the jury is out on that. There are really two schools of thought. One says that evolution to intelligent life is inevitable if you've got the right conditions. Another says that it is likely to be so rare that we might be the only species in the galaxy. Mm. So take your choice with those. And then finally, the fraction of those intelligent civilizations that develops communication technologies. Because you can imagine, you know, if there's intelligent life in the oceans of Europa or Enceladus, we're not going to know about it no, uh, because they don't see the stars. And so that then it gets multiplied by the average length of time that a civilization lasts effectively. And that's another unknown, you know, yeah. people guess a thousand years or something like that. And so you, what you've got is is you're looking for the number and you're multiplying essentially you're multiplying a rate of which stars at which stars are born by a time and that, mm. that gives you a number marvelous equation very oh, very yeah. well thought out and it stood the test of time it has the answer is still one <laughs> it might well be yes that's right us yes indeed that's it yeah i choose to believe that i mean we're probably the example of it that if the conditions are right and the circumstances are right the planet's in the right place, everything comes together right, life will exist. So when you think of the size of the universe and the number of planets that we're now starting to understand that are out there, there's got to be another one somewhere with some kind of life beyond microbial. I'm thinking maybe vegetation. Yeah, could, well, we even all, that's a big step. That's it right. is, but it's not yeah. as big a step as intelligent no, beings. But yeah. I, yeah, but... Uh, Marine life, perhaps. Who knows? Krill. I keep going with krill. <laughs> <laughs> you like your krill, don't you? <laughs> I do. I reckon yes. that's what we'll find. But, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, a great you know, equation, great, great concept to come up with all those years ago. Yes, and ahead of its time, if I can put it mm. that way. But, but uh, no, it's, it's made him very famous, of course. Um, and and, and rightly so, that. yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, very sad to hear of his passing, but 92 is a damn fine knock in cricket circles. <laughs> Indeed uh, it so, is. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, his daughter said some beautiful things about him uh, when she announced his passing as well. Yep, yep. Now let's yeah. uh, continue on, and we're headed for... Dimorphos. This is the DART mission. Now, the DART mission is a very exciting proposal because they're going to smash something into a moonlet, as far as I understand. And that will be an experiment to see if Earth is ever threatened by an asteroid, aka Bruce Willis won't be around to help us. We can help <laughs> ourselves right. by diverting it through a major impact like this. And it's set to happen, what, the 26th? Of 26th September? of September, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so we, we, you and I have talked about this before, and it is very exciting. I think mm. uh, it's going to, you know, it will be really good to demonstrate that we can actually just shift an asteroid around a little bit yep. if we need to. So uh, the the asteroid itself, the target, is called Dimorphos or Dimorphos, which is a rock only about 170 meters across. Yeah, uh, and that's what the DART spacecraft will hit, and that short for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, it's an acronym, uh, on the 26th. But Dimorphos or Dimorphos is, is in orbit around its parent asteroid. So this is the moon of an asteroid. Mm. Um, and that asteroid is called Didymos, which is a great name, which is much bigger. It's getting on for a kilometre. It's about 780, 800 kilometres, sorry, 780 or 800 metres wide. Yeah. So there it is, Didymos with Dimorphos in orbit around it. And the idea is that the spacecraft will clobber the, the, the smaller one, Dimorphos, and change its orbit in such a way that we can actually detect that orbital change. Mm. And by changing its orbit, I mean its orbit around its parent asteroid rather than the orbit of the pair of them around the sun. And that's the really clever part of this experiment, Andrew, because um, if you if you just charged at an asteroid with a small spacecraft and gave it a, a ding, um, it would take probably 
long, long time, might maybe years or possibly even decades to work out whether you've changed the orbit yeah. at all. At all. Yeah. Whereas if you've got something that's going around smaller objects in a matter of hours, then the change, the orbital change is easy, easier to detect. Mm. And so the the reason why the story's sort of in the news already, even though we're still a couple of weeks away from the impact, is that the latest news is that new observations have been made with ground-based telescopes, actually one in Arizona, one in, in Chile. <coughs> the Magellan telescopes, I've visited them uh, on <clears throat> excuse me, the mountain called Las Campanas in northern Chile. So those two telescopes have been used to observe the orbit of Dimorphos and actually calculate what it is now, because it's important to know that, yeah. to understand exactly how it's behaving. Since there are, you know, there are other factors that could come into this, like the possibility of solar radiation playing a role you don't want you know the the radiation pressure that the asteroid feels from the sun you don't want that to be screwing up your observations mm. so we we now have a really good estimate of what the orbit's like before the impact and of course over time it might not be too long it might only be a few days or a few weeks uh, we will know what the change has been to the orbit of uh, dimorphos so yes. really exciting stuff and we will talk about this again soon, no doubt. In fact, we may well have a reporter on the scene. One of our Space Nuts uh, listeners, a very keen follower of Space Nuts, Marie-Claire Mercier, has actually got herself a ticket to the big day NASA is having, having uh, at Cape Canaveral for the, uh, the impact. So she'll be there guns blazing, and we're hoping to get her on the program after that date to have a chat about what she witnessed and how it all went down. So uh, really looking forward to that. Hope we can make that happen. And you lucky, lucky duck, Marie-Claire. <laughs> yeah, that's but great to have, mm. um, yeah, we get our own team of reporters out there. This is yeah, brilliant yeah. stuff. So we're hurriedly <laughs> sending her some Space Nuts uh, stuff. <laughs> so, she can wear, so she can wear it on the day. Very good. Delighted to so hear that. Hopefully we'll be represented, but, uh, yeah, <clears throat> she's really keen to get on with us, so we'll we'll um, we'll try and make that happen. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, very excited to see how that particular experiment goes. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now, and the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger because we have professional grade supplies for every industry, even hard to find products. And we have same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Roger, your lots are here, also. Space nuts. All right. Fred, let's talk about the next story, and this is exciting too, and sort of to a, a, a small degree dovetails in with the Frank Drake equation, and that it is does. that the James Webb Space Telescope has just sent back a picture of an exoplanet orbiting a distant star, which is something we talked about it doing. It was one of the main things that it was designed to do, and it has brought back the picture up until now. We've only seen artists' impressions of these worlds that have been discovered since the 90s, and now there are thousands of them and many, many more to be catalogued. But this is the first time we've got a picky of one, isn't it? Or this first one for the James Webb Space Telescope, it, anyway? It is. It's the first with the James Webb Space Telescope because <clears throat> there, there are just a handful of, uh, of exo exoplanets which have been imaged, and um, what you might call the, you know, the flagship of those, perhaps the poster child or something like that, is a system which has um, seven planets called HR8799, actually I beg your pardon, four planets, which have been imaged. I can't remember which uh, facility they were used 
they were image by, but they've been imaged so many times mm. uh, that we've now got movies of them orbiting around their host star. That takes a bit oh, of beating. Yes. I remember uh, that now. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. So this isn't the first time it's been done, but it's the first time the Webb telescope has done it. And yeah. that's great because it demonstrates that the equipment that it carries on board in order to allow this process to take place is working. Mm. <laughs> uh, and... Um, and is doing you know exactly what was expected so the device that you have to use to block out the light of a parent star instrument actually is called a coronagraph and it dates from the idea of trying to block out the sun so you can see the sun's corona yeah. uh, which is what you see during an eclipse the outer atmosphere of the sun so you block out the light of the star because the planet itself is shining by reflected light from the star <clears throat> and could be billion, millions or billions of times fainter. Mm. In the old days, we don't do this now, but we can do it on Space Nuts. It used to be <laughs> compared with trying to spot the glow of the cigarette of the lighthouse keeper walking around the catwalk of his lighthouse right yeah. next to the light itself. It's very, you know. A very inappropriate thing to talk about now, but that's what it was compared with. And it's a really good impression that uh, that you get, something just glowing faintly yeah. uh, next to something very bright indeed. So the coronagraph blocks out the light of the star. You've got to do it carefully because uh, you can... You know, throw the baby out with the bathwater if you <laughs> if you don't do it properly. You block out the light of the planet as well. And so, what we've got from the Webb Telescope is this lovely series of four images taken with both of Webb's major instruments, NERCAM, the near infrared camera, and MIRI, the mid infrared instrument, mm. uh, at wavelengths of three, four point four four, eleven point four, and fifteen point five microns, which are sort of standard infrared filters that are used for this sort of thing. Um, so that three and four micron wavelengths are within what we'd call the near infrared. The 11 and 15 are what we would call the far, the mid infrared, which is that region where the, the wavelengths are getting longer. <clears throat> and we've got images from each of those of the planet. Now, what that means is those wavelengths are chosen so that it, they will show up um, basically the uh, features in the planets that, that sort of the planet itself is emitting light that is is affected by the elements in its atmosphere and the molecules and it's essentially the tool that you can use to work out things like the temperature of the planet and the basically the the answer to that is that the, the temperature at the top of the cloud tops because it is a gas giant it's several times the mass of jupiter yeah. um, this planet which by the way is hip 65426b uh, the cloud very, very uh, hip very hip yeah hip by the way is hipparchus it was a, a survey <laughs> satellite that surveyed um, things in the early 80s uh, an astrometric satellite measuring the positions of objects had a mm. little bit to do with that back in the day uh, so uh, the cloud tops of the planet are hotter than everybody thought something like 1400 degrees celsius Ooh. and it's um you know the curious thing is that it's its diameter is similar to jupiter mm. even though its its mass is probably rather higher so it may be a curious rocky world it's its distance from from the star itself hip65426 its distance is about 100 times the distance that we are from the sun so it's you know in fact 92 times further from from the star itself than we are from the sun yeah which is about 14 billion kilometers so that is a long way but that of course feeds into our capability to detect it it's very nice mm. that we've got something that's far enough away that you you actually do have a chance of seeing it do, so, do we know what kind of star it's orbiting uh, i was trying to find that actually <laughs> yes we do I, I think it's a giant star i suspect it is a hot star to keep the temperature of this world as high yeah. as that at 100 uh, you know over that distance for sure. units or 92 astronomical mm. units away yeah now when you look at these images uh, sort of like most images you get over a distance they're, they're just fairly blobby looking things are astronomers and scientists able to get much detail out of those images are they able to learn more about what the planet's makeup is 
I think in the end they will. That what we will be unlikely to see is continents and things of that sort because mm. the, the planet itself is below the limit of resolution of the telescope. It, it's you know below the, the the physical possibility of seeing any detail on it. It's just a point source. Yeah, and so the details that you can see the blobs in particular, there are you know some of them have got little patches of light next to them, side lobes or blobs around them. They are probably artifacts. They're probably fringes, in fact, because the, the you know the telescope is working close to its physical limit of detectability, what we call the diffraction limit. Yep. These are remnants of phenomenon that are, that are associated with that. So I, I think what we're seeing through the... So, Certainly, excuse me, through the near infrared camera images, we're definitely seeing fringing from that, and the structure around the images from the from MIRI, the mid infrared instrument. And I suspect that is also fringing that's caused by the interferometric process used to suppress the light of the star. I might be proved wrong on that, and I'm sure that as time goes on, we will start to see much more information from these. This is a first shot at it, and it's yeah. remarkable that we've got such good images in four wave bands of uh, of this planet. So I think this this speaks of a, a very bright future for the James Webb Telescope. And in fact, the the research group that's published this, and I had a look at the paper, and it's got a hundred authors, probably more. The research group thinks that the telescope is performing about 10 times better than they expected in this regard. So Wonderful. I think we'll see some really quite spectacular results coming from the web in this. Yeah. I also wonder if um, it will get a better image of an exoplanet that might be closer to us. Is that a possibility? Yeah. I didn't mention this uh, This object 385 light years away, so yeah. it is a long way off. I think it was probably chosen because it's a planet that's known to be a long way from its parent star. So Mm. you're giving yourself the best chance of detecting it. But yes, you're right. When you get nearer, I still don't believe we'll be seeing details, you know, continents and things of that sort. But I think the things that we will learn will be easier when when we look at nearer objects. Definitely. Yeah. That's very exciting. It just seems like every other day there's a new discovery or a new announcement from the James Webb Space Telescope team, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, it's it's a brand new toy, and, yeah. they're, and they're really you know pushing it to its limit at the moment. And uh, it, it's coming up trumps. It's really doing a fantastic job. Uh, that's right. It's you know I think you know it's and the the great thing Andrew is that it's absolutely across the board it's galaxies it's planets the distant universe and that's exactly what we expected from the uh, you know from the telescope when it was being planned mm, yeah well no doubt we will have more to talk about in a very short period of time regarding the James Webb Space Telescope by the way if you want to check out the images uh, you'll find them on several websites, but uh, theconversation.com is a is a really great website for, um, for seeing uh, reading about that story, but also looking at those images and many other things. It's, it's a great website in general. This is Space Nuts. You're with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, it is that time of the week <laughs> where we just sit back and do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that it? Good. Well, I might make myself oh, a coffee. Actually, no, that's that's what happens in all the other periods of time between when we start and finish this show. But uh, time to answer some questions. And we've uh, we've got one short question from John and one question in several parts from Candice. <laughs> but they're all kind of interrelated. So, yeah, they, they're hillbilly questions, basically. But we will um, get to that thought, in a moment. I thought we were the hillbillies. Yes. <laughs> Very possible. Yeah. Very possible. Uh, John is from Barnsley in the UK. Hi, Andrew and Fred. Thanks for the great podcast. I only discovered it a month back, which would be six months back now because that's how long ago he probably sent us the question. Uh, sorry, sorry, John. But I've been listening to every episode uh, every night. He's, he's catching up. Since you said you're running out of questions, well, I I am now because I, they were all deleted. <laughs> yes. um, I have a couple for you I've struggled to find an answer to. Would measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation look identical to any observer in any position in the universe? Love that question. Or would it look different based on the observer's position and their own observable universe? And would the universe have been infinite in size immediately after inflation 
And would the curvature of space-time have been flat during inflation as we measure it to be now? Thanks again. Very interesting questions. They're, they're terrific questions, yeah. And, and I love the first one because it, it actually highlights uh, exactly what the cosmic microwave background radiation is. So let's just recap. We are sitting here on Earth in a universe that's 13.8 billion years old. We can look back with our telescopes in time because that's what happens when you look out into space. The further away it is, the further back in time you're looking because of the finite speed of light. And eventually we look back so far that we see back to a time when the universe was not transparent. It was opaque and it was shining brilliantly mm. with light. It was, And that's essentially the... You know, the universe, which is still glowing because of the Big Bang itself. We think that was a time about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So that's as far back as we're looking when we see the cosmic microwave background radiation. What we see, though, when we analyze it, and there have been three spacecraft that have worked on this and given us a very accurate map of the big, the, the cosmic microwave background radiation because it covers the entire sky. That map shows very, very tiny fluctuations in temperature across it, little blobs of slightly warmer, little blobs of slightly cooler. Yeah. Uh, and it's by analysing what we call the spatial frequency of those that it's the distribution of those blobs uh, across the sky that we learn so much about the um, Big Bang itself and the conditions that prevailed at the time that the universe became transparent. So it's, it's like a wall of radiation with these little dips and troughs superimposed on it, a level of about one in 10 to the fifth. They're tiny, yeah. really tiny. It took a long time before they could be detected uh, rather than just seeing a, a constant, you know, basically stream of microwave radiation from every direction. And by the way, it's microwaves just because the universe has expanded by about, I think it's about 1,300 times since the light was emitted. So what was visible light to start with 13.8 billion years ago is now microwaves, mm -hmm. which is just as well because if it was visible light, it would be very bright indeed. Yes, uh, and all we'd, over the we'd, sky. Be very, we'd be very different creatures, I imagine. I think we'd have been frazzled, actually. I don't think we'd oh. have made it at all. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so John's question is absolutely on the money because our view of that is a kind of optical illusion. It, we are seeing that radiation, and yes, it's going to it's going to look more or less the same everywhere. But the tiny little patches of hot and cold on it, which, by the way, come from sound waves oscillating through the early universe, it's what, the, what are called the baryonic acoustic oscillations. Those little blobs are going to look different if you're in a different place in the universe. Mm. Uh, even though your view is being, you know, you can still only see the far, as far back as the cosmic microwave background radiation. You might be in a completely different bit of the universe, which is much bigger than that sphere that we can see. Yeah. Uh, so you will see different a different pattern of temperatures, but the power spectrum, the uh, you know the, the characteristic of that of those glows will be the same uh, because it's all to do with the conditions in the Big Bang itself. So it's a really really perceptive question, John. And by the way, John comes from a place not very far from where I grew up. He'd probably speak a bit like I do with a bit of a Yorkshire accent. <laughs> And then the other questions, yeah. um, so inflation increased the universe's diameter hugely, but we don't know whether it was infinite. Mm. All we know is it stretched the universe rapidly, I mean super rapidly, 10 to the minus 33 of a second or something of that order, and it stretches by 10 to the 50 or something in that order it's you know it just we just can't get our heads around it yeah uh, but may well have made it infinite and in fact it, as john suggests it may have flattened the geometry of the universe so by a flat universe you and i have spoken about this before we don't mean a universe shaped like a tabletop we mean a universe in which the laws of geometry that we have around us actually um uh, work so parallel lines never meet and things of that sort yeah well, yeah, so infinite, not as in never-ending, but infinite as in... Never-ending. <laughs> never-ending. <laughs> I mean, so, um, so let's... My, uh, my brain just went, stop, Andrew, snap. you don't know what you're saying. Yeah, no, no, well, actually, I get that feeling as well for me. <laughs> the best way to think of it is just to imagine the universe was like the surface of a sphere, which is, um, you know, it's infinite in the sense that you could keep on going forever. Ah, yeah, but, that's what I was it, trying to say. 
but that's right but it's yeah. bounded it's bounded it's not unbounded that's the mm. thing well that's that's <laughs> that's what a ring represents eternity it's never ending see it never ends infinite i thought it was just represented the fact that you can stick something on your finger where you remember it <laughs> well that's probably the truth of it yes, <laughs> yes. Mm. but i do like that i do like that impression yeah. yes uh, so did that also cover the curvature of space time as being flat during inflation <laughs> yes yes pay attention andrew i wasn't sure i think i said that <laughs> i think you did yeah the, the flat universe no it's, it's absolutely right curvature of space time and that sort of flies in the face of the model I've just put up with a suggested with a ball. Mm. But you get the idea. Yes, I do indeed. I hope, right. <laughs> I hope John does too. I'm sure he does. <laughs> Thank you, John. Let's move on to Alberta, Canada. Hi, Candice. Hello, Dr. Watson and Mr. Dunkley. Love the content of your podcast. Has it got content? Um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, something like that. Makes the mind wander and wonder. I know you get a lot of black hole questions. My questions are not about black holes directly, rather about what is around them. I understand the only way we are sure there is a black hole at the centre of our galaxy is because of the stars we can see that are racing around something that is invisible. Uh, now, about those stars. Now, she's got four questions here. I'll ask question one, but they'll all dovetail into each other. Mm -hmm. uh, could these stars have planets orbiting them or would the speed that they are moving prevent them from having planets or would the distortion of space caused by the black hole prevent anything from settling into an orbit or would the gravity of the black hole have trumped the gravity of the stars and just pulled it, uh, uh, pulled anything relatively small, leaving nothing left but the larger stars? That's question one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, they're great questions. And it's correct. It's not the only way that we know there's a black hole at the centre of our galaxy, because now we've got an image of its event horizon with the event horizon telescope. Uh, this question might have come in before we reported that a few months ago. Uh, the um, But... Yes, the, there's a whole swarm of stars which are orbiting around the black hole in the centre of our galaxy, and it's by observing those over the last 30 years or so that we know that there's something in the middle that has enough gravity to keep them bound in their orbits, but has got to be compact, and the only thing it can be is a black hole. So when you think about those stars, they are, they're not being pulled apart. They're not being spaghettified by the black hole. That will spaghettify things that get nearer to it. But these stars are in stable orbits. They are affected by the gravity of the black hole because they are subject to quite strong relativistic effects. That means that they behave rather than under Newtonian dynamics, they behave under the dynamics of general relativity, which mm. is all about space being distorted by by mass. So they will be, but they are still intact. And that means that their gravity, their own self gravity is enough to hold them together. And it probably suggests that if they had planets, uh, depending on the mass of the planets and where they were in orbit around the star, they would hold on to them as well. Uh, there might well be times, you know, when the when there's a tug of war between the gravitational pull of the black hole and the gravitational pull of the of the star. But I can imagine that the situation will be that the planets could be in stable orbits around the stars. Okay. Well, that leads us to the next part now that we've yep. established that. Yep. Uh, if, if there were planets around these stars, would there be anything preventing life from existing on them? Maybe the radiation, maybe something yeah, along those lines? That's that's right. So there certainly is radiation. Uh, you know, you are near a very strong source of X-rays, uh, which is the black hole itself. Yeah. Uh, so I think there'd be a good chance that those planets would be highly sterilised mm. uh, and life might not have taken off. It's a very good point. I mean, the gravitational, you know, if, if you didn't have the rad radiation, I suspect, and you just had a black hole, say an inactive black hole, a quiescent black hole that's not doing anything, not gobbling up anything around it, uh, then it might allow living organisms to, to form. Of course, I should qualify this, Andrew, by the fact that there are organisms that cheerfully grab radiation. Oh, yeah. Is it Dinococcus, I think its name is, can withstand three times, 3,000 times the lethal dose of gamma rays for humans. And it, it's cheerful. I think it's called Dinococcus. I did a cartoon of it in uh, Space Warp, uh, the book, and um, it's, a, it's an extremophile. It's, uh, you know, a 
basically a microbe that loves extremes. Yeah. So it may well be that there could be radiation tolerant, radiation tolerant microbes or living organisms on these planets. So never say never. Never, indeed, yeah. uh, which leads to the next part of the question, which I'll, I'll paraphrase. What would the night sky look like uh, on on these kinds of planets? Yeah, um, well, you're in the middle of a cluster of stars, so it would be much more brilliance in the night sky than we have in ours in the sort of galactic suburbs. I think uh, there'd be lots of stars, Black hole itself would be something that you'd only see with infrared or radio observations. It would be a lurking monster, not very far away. In the nearest stars are within the, the distances from the black hole are measured in trillions of kilometers. That's the same as the planet of HIP, whatever it was that we were talking about a few minutes ago, which is yep. fourteen trillion kilometers away. I think mm. is the the distance. Uh, actually, it probably wasn't that. It's probably something slightly less than that. But anyway, trillions of kilometers. Uh, so, so the black hole would be a looming presence there. I think. Uh, wouldn't I, I think it'd be a spectacular sky. Yeah, you'd still see. I mean, you're immersed in the galactic bulge, so there wouldn't be a Milky Way. Mm. You'd have stars all around you. You'd have a very, very bright sky because of the stars, and probably just a bright haze of stars that would yeah. would really make the. It just sky sounds like bright. sleepless nights to me. But uh, <laughs> well, that's right. You need your eye mask. Yeah. And a final question from Candice: uh, In our search for Earth-like planets, is there a limit in the galaxy where we can say there's no point looking at the stars? Um, uh, and she sort of alludes to sort of the closer yes, to, you get to, to galactic centre, yeah, you know, it gets less and less likely. It's more, I suspect some astrobiologists would like to look for planets <clears throat> anywhere. What you're faced with is the difficulty. And, you know, when you think of it, the the stars who's, that we know have planets are all within about 1,500 light years of the of our solar system, yeah. something like that. <clears throat> Whereas the the galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter, maybe more. So we're only sampling a tiny, tiny fraction of the galaxy, mm. which a uh, sensible thing to do. It, you know, it will be much harder because the simply the technical difficulties get higher and higher as you look at fainter and fainter stars. So you're limited by our equipment to only see things within that distance. But it's also where you're most likely to find them because galactic suburbs are a relatively quiet and peaceful place in terms of horrible things happening, you know, radiation and stuff like that. So it's, uh, yes, it's probably, a, and collisions, it's probably a good a good place to be looking anyway. Yeah, fair enough. All right. Candice, thanks for uh, your questions. All very exciting. Uh, Candice goes on to say, thanks for the entertainment. I'm probably too old to be wondering about such fanciful things, but there's nothing worth watching on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks, yeah, Candice. And uh, let me assure you, from personal experience, you're never too old. <laughs> never, never too old. Don't stop. Keeps yeah. keeps this thing working. Keeps it working. Keep, keeps right. it going. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, that just about wraps it up for another week, Fred. Just a reminder to people: if you do have questions for us, and yes, please send some in because I've I've lost them all. You can do that via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Click on the AMA link to send us your text question or your audio question, or you can click on the button on the right, send us your voice question. If you've got a device with a microphone, you're all set, and it's as easy as just uh, telling us who you are and what your question is. And tell us where you're from as well if we can't pick up the accent. Uh, Don't forget, if you want to become a patron, uh, there's information on the website about that. Uh, We do occasionally get people saying, how do I... um, How do I sort of contribute to the show? You can do that through Patreon or Supercast or just through um, buying us a cup of coffee. That's an option. Uh, We're on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on TikTok. We're on Facebook. uh, We're on Instagram. So look us up there and and follow us. And don't forget to leave reviews. We love your reviews. We've been getting quite a few really nice ones lately. Um, One and a half stars. I think it was really good, that one. (laughs) Uh, Yes, uh, please, um, through your podcast platform, if you're able to give reviews, you can do that. And you can do it on Spotify now. And last but not least, don't forget about our new podcast, Astronomy Daily, where we uh, talk day-to-day astronomy and space science news, which you can find on the same website, spacenuts.io. I think that's everything. Fred, thank you so much. Always good to chat. 
Indeed. And uh, some great questions and uh, lovely to, to get your mind around them. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Thanks, Fred. We'll catch you next week. Sounds great. Thanks, Andrew. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and thanks to Hugh back in the studio, who's been very quiet today. He must be trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. Uh, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. Catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.